Okay, let's talk about what happened. So, um, unfortunately, with these situations, what seems to be happening now with these large environmental disasters, with these large problems, um, really, the, there's a lot of running around with your head cut off kind of thing. Um, we see a lot of um, craziness going on. That craziness seems to infect how even the managers sometimes respond. It's also incredibly easy for incorrect thinking, inaccuracies to enter not just into the popular conception, but actually the folks trying to deal with the situation as well. So here we go. Hopefully this isn't too loud for you. Uh, officials at BP have filed permits to once again drill for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, BP said it's easier than ever to find oil in the Gulf because most of it's now on top of the water. <laughs> so to scoop it up. In. So, that, uh, funny joke, but that's not actually correct. There's, so there's that, an oily seagull, seagull in there yeah, over there who's not clapping. <laughs> so, um, that notion that all this oil is on the surface, wrong. Totally not what happened. Conan O'Brien was wrong. I was wrong. Almost everybody was wrong. And this incorrect impression drove a lot of our management, a lot of our responses, and maybe took us in some um, directions that weren't as effective as they otherwise could have been. So I told you guys about our, our ecotoxicological working group, and here's some of the people there. Um, originally, when we formed our working group, again, it was not to do research, it was to, you know, provide expert knowledge from afar for people that are running around trying to deal with this insane problem and their heads are down, buried in the weeds. We were just trying to do some high-level stuff, maybe do some after the fact, some idea of how the oil moved through different e the ecosystem, but originally this is what I, I proposed, something like this. Okay. Uh, take a little bit of pause here for a second. It's important for you guys to know that we pretty much don't have any natural disasters anymore. Our human footprint is such that anytime a so-called quote-unquote natural disaster happens, it is greatly magnified, greatly changed by our human activities. Either that natural disaster becomes a human disaster, or in the case of things like climate change, we're actually causing the disaster to either, if not start, to become more intense or to worsen. So we no longer have natural disasters. So um, here is a slide from, uh, that I got from Vanessa's dad. Uh, so this is, uh, you guys are familiar with this now, New Orleans. You can all find where we're talking about. There's like Pontchartrain, all that good stuff. These are oil and gas, this is uh, one subset, this is old, so this is even current, but this is one subset of the oil and gas distribution network. Here are, uh, here are oil wells, uh, offshore wells in the Gulf. Here are uh, things on land, mostly gas. So have a look at that. It pretty much the entire state, state waters, state lands, it is, we're, we're sucking everything out of this part of our country. The well that failed, the Macondo well, wasn't, um, you know, unique. What I'm showing you with this graph is the, now this is just in the water, so offshore wells, offshore oil drilling. Um, the color represents the year. So the darker the color, the more recent that well was begun being drilled. And then the size of the uh, dot indicates how far below sea level the ocean was, uh, the, 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 the bottom of the ocean was um, where that drill, drill went in. So what you see is, we start off, so I, normally I ask you guys questions and we have a dialogue, but I'm trying to go fast. So I'm just going to run through this. If I'm going too fast, stop me, okay? Uh, so uh, what you see is, uh, we started off close to shore back in the day, and then we migrate out deeper and deeper. Why? Because it's easier to go shallow. It's, it's much cheaper, much more logistically tractable, all that good stuff. So we got the low-hanging fruit, and we've been going deeper and deeper because we're more and more desperate to get oil. 
And as we go deeper, it gets harder to extract. The red diamond is where uh, the Deepwater Horizon wellhead um, was, the Macondo well. This is not something that only happens here. This deep water drilling is going on around the world. In the North Sea, this is a, this is a effort to do this off in Brazilian waters. Um, this is a, a common thing. And we're also going deep to get minerals and things like that. In this case, this is an example from um, uh, Solwara Sol 1, which is currently on hold, but in Papua New Guinea. But the idea here is to break off minerals off of um, thermal vents down in the ocean. We, we know a little bit about Katrina now. We're learning more about Katrina. This is when it was a Category 5. Before it la made landfall, you guys have seen this. We can skip all this. One thing we didn't talk about last time was we focus on the flooding disaster and, and, and the human toll totally understandably. What's important to note is Hurricane Katrina was a massive oil spill. It amounted to a massive oil release across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we had at least 50 major uh, point releases of oil, a pipe breaking, something of that nature. We had at least 10 major spills that were all across the region. Some of these were spills of a platform. Most of these, though, were spills of storage facilities. So oil and gas storage tank farm kind of things uh, floated away, broke, did whatever the case was. Um, as far as things that weren't a, a very clear point source, there was something like over 100,000 uh, oil spills, you know, not readily identifiable, uh, readily identifiable point source releases of hydrocarbon. And so this, this quote from the, uh, in the immediate um, aftermath of Katrina from the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality says, everywhere we look, there's a spill. It all adds up. There's almost a solid sheen over the entire area right now. So when you add this up, that comes up to be at least, at least on the order of a qu quarter of a million barrels of oil, which is a huge amount of oil. Nobody talks about this because we're all busy trying to save people's lives, trying to staunch the flooding of the city of New Orleans, et cetera. So it didn't get the attention it otherwise would have received. Some colleagues and I are writing a paper on the oil spills across the globe, but suffice it to say, it's important you guys have at least a sense for what oil spills are like. Um, now I don't have, on this slide, I don't have um, the refugio spill, but this, is, this will give you some rough idea, right? If you guys are interested in this, you should take my coastal marine management class in the fall. We talk a little bit more about this. But suffice it to say, um, uh, this was uh, the um, Deepwater Horizon oil spill release. This number it comes from what's called the Flow Rate Technical Group. This is what <laughs> our, um, sci these are the scientists. The judge did, the judge in the case decided not to use this number because, you know, why would you trust the engineering scientists, guys? So the official legally accepted amount is a little bit less than this, but this is the real number. So this is the one that I go with. Um, but if we talk about, by, in comparison, in, under the first Iraq war, which you guys were all probably not even born then or something like that, um, this, in this case, uh, the first Iraq war happened, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, and then when the allies are getting ready to go uh, save Kuwait, they retreat and they set all these oil rigs on fire. They blow up oil rigs. They just allow oil, they, they, all this release of oil directly into the ocean and set it on fire. One, to create a black smoke screen so our satellites couldn't see the retreating tanks and stuff, but also as a big middle finger to say, screw you, right? Massive. Now, this was a war zone. They also mined a lot of these things. So, so we have very poor data on exactly, you think that we know something like this, we don't know the exact amount of oil released because of all these. It was basically like hell on earth, and it was and um, it was very difficult. So 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 we have a relatively large range of oil released in the Kuwait, Kuwait spill, but basically that was about 150 percent as much oil as rele was released from the Deepwater Horizon. The Exxon spill was a fraction of what the uh, Deepwater Horizon was. Ixtoc was the closest analogy we had to the Deepwater Horizon. This was a Mexic This is Pemex, a Mexican national oil rig, which was in Mexican waters um, uh, at the end of the 70s that spilled and, and released oil, uh, but only about 50 meters deep, not, not, not as deep as the Deepwater Horizon, which is about uh, 1,500 meters. Uh, then the Santa Barbara oil spill, which is incredibly important in terms of environmental policy, the first big super tanker. And then most importantly, this is what people get wrong. You're not allowed to get this wrong. 
the Deepwater Horizon was not the largest oil spill in U.S. history. The Deepwater Horizon was the largest marine oil spill in U.S. history. The largest oil spill, if you look right here, it's almost twice as much oil released as the Deepwater Horizon, is the Lakeview Gusher. That's about an hour drive from here. You guys need to go see that before you graduate. It's, it's crazy. This is the Lakeview Gusher. This is 100 years before the Deepwater Horizon. What you're seeing is a river of oil from this broken derrick that ran for about a year. It created uh, pools of water 30 meters deep. They ran train tracks out from LA and it was a tourist attraction to come see this fountain of oil that would blast up like this, blast up into the ocean. These guys are paddling over a lake of oil. Crazy, crazy stuff. Um, here it is fountaining up right here in this, in this, uh, the center of the, the former wellhead. Um, general themes that we see from oil spills, uh, all how, how you think of an oil spill was dictated by the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. That set in American thinking and to a great extent global thinking, how we understand oil spills, how we react. Every single thing after that has followed the, the cues for better and for worse from the, from the uh, Santa Barbara oil spill. So the first theme was that this was an immense uncontrolled spill, didn't know how to control it. This is the oil bubbling up off, over platform A, just off of Summerland. Um, we were technologically impotent. We didn't know how to stop it. This is a U-2 spy plane photo because we didn't have satellites that could help us understand this. We didn't have sensors. So we had to take a spy plane that was supposed to be looking at missiles in Russia and fly it over the oil spill. How do we deal with it? We throw hay on the ground, let that hay absorb the oil, and then fork up the hay and throw it in a, in a landfill. Super high tech. This has continued to this day, which is we have an incredible, literally these guys drilling the bottom of the ocean, they're like guys going to Mars. I mean, the technology is absolutely incredible, awesome technology, amazingly powerful tools and engineering approaches. The cleanup technology, not so much. It's still mostly straw on the beach. That's not, that's not important to our society to figure out how to clean up the oil once it spills. Then another, a third theme from this Santa Barbara spill that we're, we're stuck with is this notion of environmental impact. It's the first time we really came to grips with the environmental impact. And, and I, went to, I was an undergrad at UCSB, and this is really bad if you're an undergrad. So this is oiled kelp, so the ecosystem's messed up. The, the warm fuzzies, the critters, in this case this cormorant, is covered with oil. And then the surfboard is covered with oil. Your recreation, your entertainment, everything is messed up. Um, we also have set the stage of, unfortunately, things like the, the then head of this oil company, Unical, or Union Oil, um, it says, and this is from the harbor of Santa Barbara, trying to, uh, with all these reporters asking him questions, he's like, why are you guys worried about this oil spill? He says, I don't like to call it a disaster because there's been no loss of human life. I'm amazed at the publicity for the loss of a few birds. You know, open mouth, insert foot, kind of completely tone deaf response, right? Um, this is also the first oil spill where we started to treat birds, oiled, oiled seabirds, with essentially dishwashing soap to get the oil out of their leaves. Uh, their leaves. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> feathers. Feathers. Now, it turns out most of these birds are going to die because uh, these birds need to stay uh, clean and have their feathers be intact so they're insulated from the cold ocean waters. So when they get crud on them, they preen themselves. And so when they're covered with oil, they're basically ingesting all this oil. So usually by the time we get to them, they're already so far exposed to oil that they're, they're, they're um, not likely to make it. But nevertheless, this was the start of just trying to do something. Huge media firestorm. Everything from women uh, getting naked at the airport to protest uh, to uh, the, the local high school throwing out its, its school play and writing a melodrama where, if you can't see this, there's this, the, 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 the poor defenseless woman is named Barbara. And the evil villain is an oil company, uh, oil baron dripping with oil, right? Um, uh, then finally the president, after days, the president has to come. And what does he do? He walks on the beach and looks very serious, right? So that's what happens, right? Okay, we'll have Kamala Harris come to the oil spill. We'll, and, and Refugio, we'll have President Obama come to, you know, they have to be shown as doing something, even though they're not really, you know, it's not, they, they don't, they can't help. But it, all this stuff comes from the Santa Barbara oil spill. Suffice it to say, you can ask me about this, it's set up how we think of oil spills, and it's probably wrong. 
Um, so uh, we had the Ixtoc one. I said that 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 thing that happened in 1979, and this is where it happened. Thank God, all this oil went this way, and it was able to weather. Oil is made up of a bunch of stuff, some of which is really toxic, some of which is less toxic. The most toxic stuff is like gasoline. That evaporates really quickly. The less toxic, toxic stuff is like tar, asphalt. And that, that um, uh, is heavier. So what happened was, the, the, um, this, is the, this is the area impacted the red, but really it mostly blew up and, and made landfall uh, months later up in Texas. So this was uh, uh, the, the most similar model that we possibly have. And we can talk about the Exxon spill, et cetera. Okay, let's talk real quickly about the Gulf Coast ecology. Gulf of Mexico is a big bowl, an, an almost complete bowl with a broken lip. This whole area is containing this, the Caribbean, this mass of water, and there's a little bit of an opening over here. If you look at this, Florida is basically one giant coral reef. It's, it's a dead coral reef. And so what we see is we have some areas, and Dr. Patches should be given this. She's the expert on this. But so um, we have this uh, area where is mostly uh, biologically derived sediments that break down into sand and stuff. We have a little bit of area over here where, where the sediments are coming from uh, land and, and, and they're, they're more uh, basically degraded rocks and stuff like that. Um, but, the, but the key thing is uh, we, we have a relatively contained mass of water. Um, we have things that, that, that come up, but most importantly, we have this seasonality. Because we're not exposed to the wide open ocean, in places like Louisiana, the river flow, which is one of the, Mississippi, one of the great rivers of the world, this fresh water flowing out has a huge impact on the water and the currents and all, the, all this good stuff. So we have clear seasonality in the Gulf of Mexico based on how much fresh water is blasting out into this salty ocean water. <clears throat> we have some communities that we don't necessarily have a lot of here or, or anything like it here in California. So just to, to emphasize, and again, anybody can chime in if you guys want to add to this, but we have what we might call the coastal fringe. This example is from uh, Texas, which, uh, which would be this sort of transition zone of a beach to wetlands to sort of back wetlands and seagrass beds underneath. We have coastal wetlands, as we've talked about. And as we've said, these things are dissolving. And, they're, and as you see up here, we really have this now jigsaw puzzle of eroding Swiss cheesy like landscapes. We have forested wetlands. We have more marshes. We have seagrass beds, another really important habitat that we have here as well, but nowhere near as extensively as, our, as we do in the Gulf Coast. Really, really important areas. And I'm showing you these images here from Florida. Uh, really, really important for little things, little crabs, little fish that it's a place for them to get food, hang out from predators, hide from predators, really important ecosystem. We also have in the Gulf of Mexico, so those, that image I showed you before, so many guys out, so, many, uh, so much infrastructure out there that actually our human infrastructure is a major habitat type. So these artificial reefs from gas and oil platforms, this picture I took from Dolphin, I Dolphin Island Sea Lab, where my group was meeting uh, at one point, and you just look straight off of the lab and you see uh, oil derrick, oil derrick, oil derrick, oil derrick. We have a few places like the Santa Barbara Channel, we have a little bit of that, but nothing like the density and the complexity. Not just the oil derricks, but all the pipes that are connecting all these things. Um, uh, so we have pelagic waters. Um, so we have these red drum swimming around. And here's a big school of red drum, this is from an ROV. So lots of good, uh, good guys like that. We also have sargassum. You guys might have heard, the, heard, about, heard of the sargasso sea or the sargassum sea. This is a brown alga that uh, is normally attached to the bottom of the ocean. But this particular species, the thallus, the, the, the stem, if you will, is really brittle and easily breaks off. And then it floats and it accumulates. So in that lower picture to the right, it looks like there's an oil slick, an oil spill. Not an oil spill. That's a bunch of algae. And so this ecosystem is particularly vulnerable to oil spills. Because this stuff floats, all these communities build up. Look, Michaela will like this. There's a bunch of uh, plastic trash accumulated here. And so <laughs> the ways that this place uh, or the, the factors that drive the algae to accumulate here and little gyres and stuff also will act to pull in the oil. So this is a community really particularly vulnerable 
and all the little fishies and, and babies that are hanging out underneath this, this structure are really vulnerable to oil exposure. Um, not, it's not California. This is definitely not California. We don't have the kind of clear water that we have here in the rocky reefs. The reefs tend to be really muddy. And what we would call a reef, well, yeah, they have very shallow relief reefs. So here, here's, here's another uh, example. So this reef is a, is a couple meters off the bottom. That's a reef. For us, that would be like, I don't know, a spilled box or something, right? So we have these very straight, big, jaggy, huge reefs. Here in this part of the world, we have very muddy bottom, low relief reefs. Okay, um, deep water horizon. What happened with the deep water horizon? Um, uh, this was the what's called, so-called Macondo Prospect. How this works is this is your resource. This is not my, well, it's our resource. It's, it's your resource and my resource. The government of the U.S. considers mineral and oil and mineral uh, deposits public resources. So then they want to make some money so we can pay for our building here at school, but they don't really give us any money for that's a bad example. They want us to give us money to fix their highways. They don't really fix the highways, but, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Something. They do something, right? And so, and so what they do is they go, okay, here's this area. We think, and they do some exploratory. They go, oh, there's like some oil down here with, with uh, sound waves and stuff bouncing through the bottom of the ocean. They go, okay, hey, who wants to bid on this? And then oil and gas companies have a bunch of geologists and they think about it and they go, damn, we can make a lot of skrilla on that if it's X amount of oil. And so then they bid in a closed bid process, public bid. Anybody can bid. You put your, I say, ah, for, for block number whatever, I bid on this. I pay, if I win, I pay the government whether there's any oil there or not. Okay? So it's definitely prospecting is the right word because maybe you're going to strike it rich, maybe you're not going to make any oil, you're not pull up any oil. In this case, this, it used to be an oil company would bid on this. Not anymore because everything has to get so much more complex. Now there are consortiums that form that do this. So in this case, this was a, we all talk about the BP drill. This was a consortium of which BP was the primary, primary owner, shareholder. But um, it, uh, it, was, it was a bunch of folks. They leased it in 2008. Uh, it was specifically uh, Mississippi Canyon Block 252, which is about 70 kilometers from the coast. And as I said, it's almost exactly 1,500 meters. The, the bottom of the ocean is almost exactly 1,500 meters deep. Um, and has a lot of light, sweet crude, which means it doesn't have a lot of sulfur. And has a lot, it's more gasoline-like than it is tar-like. They hire, they immediately hire Transocean, which is a company that specializes in making deep, mobile, floating mobile oil plat uh, drilling platforms that drill very deep. So this is another thing that you guys can take my coastal class if you want to know. So the company's in Texas, but it's flagged as the Marshall Islands because it's cheaper for taxes. So why would you want to have it, you know, fl flagged in Texas if you're in Texas? Anyway, this particular platform was launched in 2001 and essentially BP would lease it in five-year installments. So it's another company's device, but BP is controlling it and telling them what to do. It held the record as the, for the deepest oil drilling in the world. Now, let me explain what this means. So what I told you was the amount of the depth of the water over the bottom of the ocean. That's just the start to drill, right? Then once you get down there, you got to drill. So the record um, was 10,000 683 meters below the bottom of the ocean. This is crazy stuff. I mean, this is really amazing, amazing technology. So this was an incredible piece of uh, engineering. Um, essentially, we drill and we find out that there's oil here, great, and then we seal it off and we go away. And we, and with the idea being that another uh, a production platform would come float over, rehook up all the pipes, and then actually get oil for um, for, for, you know, uh, refining and doing all the stuff we want. So the problem with the Deepwater Horizon, this is still being contested, so, but this is what actually happened, um, despite what the lawyers say. Uh, it costs a lot of money to rent this thing, right? We're talking about a million dollars a day to rent this thing. And, you're not, and these guys, at this point, are not making money, right? They're just drilling, exploring, showing it, it, it works. And so there's a lot of pressure to hurry up, let's get this done faster, faster, faster. 
a company called Halliburton was contracted to do the cementing in. Essentially, here's that big straw going to the ocean. We're going to put a plug inside that straw. So, so that the, the soda in our soda cup was being shaken up, high pressure, doesn't spritz out the straw. They didn't do that right. They went too fast and they didn't allow it to stabilize. And essentially, um, these guys were on the rig. At, uh, uh, people were on the wor working on the, were on the rig. Now, the rigs get energy from the oil and gas that, that, they're, that they're producing. So they had these generators. So these guys are sitting there and there's lights and everything. Then all of a sudden, they start hearing this weird sound. And then all of a sudden, this bang. And then the generators, all the lights basically blow up. All, so the generator essentially, suck, which is used to sucking in uh, gas and then uh, air, so much natural gas burped up, methane burped up, that the natural gas got sucked into the, sucked into the generator and the generator and it essentially blew up. So it blew out the lights, it spiked, and then it blew up the rig. Um, it was so-called methane kick. If the cementing had been done properly, that could never, that should never have been allowed to happen. Now there's all kinds of problems. I'm, I'm going really fast here, so I'm not, I'm not talking about all the problems, but there was in, inappropriate maintenance of the, of the drill pipe and all this kind of stuff. So immediately, 11 people died on the evening of April 20th, and 17 were injured, and the rig begins to burn over the course of the next day and a half, and it eventually sinks. It's going to fall to the bottom of the ocean, and it's going to settle a few hundred meters from the actual wellhead at the bottom of the ocean. It's a flexible tube, so that tube is sort of piled up on the, on the bottom of the ocean. The first slick is detected as that thing is basically starting to go down. So at the time, people are saying this is bad, this is messed up, but it's an industrial accident. Nobody's thinking it's going to lead to this massive oil spill. Um, so people are using things like crisis averted. This is so great. Okay. Then we see this oil sheen and people say, oh, that's probably just some of the uh, service boats or whatever nearby. And it probably wasn't a big thing. Um, Homeland Security re releases a risk and an unfortunate re uh, risk analysis. It says the incident poses, quote, uh, a, a neg this is the day after it sank, a negligible risk to regional oil supply markets. It will not cause significant national economic impacts. And then the White House's press secretary says, uh, I honestly don't think it could open up a whole new series of questions because, you know, in all honesty, I doubt this is the first accident that has happened and I doubt it'll be the last, right? Very much comes to regret that. <clears throat> to give you the proper context of this, uh, BP, which is British Petroleum, changed their name to BP from British Petroleum because it sounded better. Uh, they started this campaign called Beyond Petroleum. So they said, it's not called British Petroleum, it's Beyond Petroleum. Why? Because we're doing solar panels and we're like an energy company, not an oil company. That lasts for a little while. And then they have a new guy, uh, Tony Hayworth, comes, on, came, comes in and heads a company. He goes, screw that, we're an oil company. Stops that Beyond Petroleum thing, goes back to being the traditional oil company that they always were. What you heard at the time, I heard this at the time. Um, this is a quote from one of my neighbors at a party at my, at, at my, my street because we party a lot. Um, he said, oh, you know, it's messed up and this is bad. But you know what? Accidents happen. You know, law of averages. It could have happened to anybody. No. You need to understand that is not what happened here. Of course, if we drive a million miles at some point, we're going to get a flat tire, that kind of thing. But that is not what's going on here. So this is, this is at the 20, before 2010, so before this happened, 760 of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's um, uh, 761 egregious and willful violations across all our U.S. refineries um, from the three years leading up to this were BPs. Um, BP now has a widely understood policy that we now refer to and they refer to as run to failure. You have a car. I'm going to drive my car. And every so often, right, dad said, change the oil, right? This is like, go and have somebody change the oil. Let's put in some fluid, right? Let's do that. That's not what BP did. Their policy was you drive the car till the engine seizes up and then leave it on the side of the road and get another car. Literally, that was the policy in the Alaskan oil fields and other places. For example, in 2005, they, they owned a refinery in Texas City, Texas, 
that blew up and killed 15 people and injured a huge number of people, 180 people. Um, they were levied um, a total of $370 million in initial fines. And then, uh, four years later, they got 80, almost $88 million in fines because they didn't fix the stuff. This was not a just random you know, company doing stuff and then an accident happened. This is, this is caused by negligence. So here's one of the few good things that came out of WikiLeaks. So I, I have a project in Eastern Turkey and, and in full disclosure, uh, our NGO has gotten some money from these, ga these gas pipelines that run through our part of Turkey. So just so that we're, we're uh, full disclosure here. So uh, here's, here's Turkey. Here is um, Azerbaijan. They have, they have this huge um, uh, gas field. This country has no industry. 95% of their gross domestic product is revenue from oil and gas, uh, mostly gas stuff. Um, so this is a pipeline that's running through Turkey. Why? Because Russia likes to control Europe. So Russia supplies a lot of gas to Western Europe. So this oil and gas pipeline went in uh, a little bit before here to provide another route for gas to get to Europe so that Russia wouldn't have as much of a chokehold. Okay, point is major socioeconomic, political, all that kind of machinations. So this happened in 2008. We only know of this because of WikiLeaks because these guys released it as part of the classified documents. So what happened was all of a sudden, boom, big, huge oil and gas explosion in one of the rigs in the Caspian Sea. Nobody knows what's going on. The Aziri government makes all, essentially all of their money from oil and gas proceeds. So when the, ga when the gas fields shut down, they're like, whoa, 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 what's going on? So they complain to the Americans and the American embassy sends a guy out to go uh, you know, look at what's going on. And because he wrote transcripts back, they were in the diplomatic cables, they were released with WikiLeaks. That's how we know this happened. Otherwise, we would not know the full story. At least the public would not know this. See if this sounds familiar. BP platform, a consortium with other people, Chevron, all these other folks were in, in this. Drilling, 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 a oh, problem. Didn't properly uh, cement the, uh, the well bore, blows up. So in this case, thankfully no one died. No one, BP will talk to no one. They will not talk to Chevron. They will not talk to their other oil and gas partners. The other oil and gas partners are like, what the hell's going on? They can't even get any, any, any facts out. So uh, BP shut it all down. No information coming out. No information, no, no realistic investigation. Same kind of story. So this was not unique. This is one of the, this was alleged to be one of the problems and we now know there's other problems, but this was what got the blame. This is the so-called blowout preventer. This is a big giant scissors. Okay, we have this metal tube and if there's a problem, the blowout preventer kicks on and that big, big, big wrench pinches the pipe and seals it closed. So if anything goes wrong, it'll seal it. Everything is wrong with this thing. This is still, I believe, on an Air Force base um, in evidence. Didn't have batteries that worked. This thing didn't work. They put the joint, so imagine a tube, we put straws together, right? And we have a tube, then we put the straws together, maybe they're like double thick where they join. They put one of the double thick joints right where the, so it actually couldn't have probably ever pinched off. So, I mean, it goes on and on and on and on and on. And so for the first couple days when this is leaking, we realize it's, it's an oil spill. They send this guy down, this is a little ROV, like we have in our lab, but it's a more expensive one, fancier one. And it goes down and literally what's it, what it's doing is it's going like this, click, 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 click. They're flicking the switch to say like, go on, come on. It's like you go home and the lights don't work. You're like, I'm gonna turn it on again. Oh crap, I'm gonna turn it off. <laughs> Come on, it'll go on at some point, right? I really don't want to climb up there and replace the light. Same exact thing. For days, they're, like, they're click, 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 click. Um, uh, it, yeah, geez, I gotta go fast. Okay, so, um, so a lot of oil is spilling out. N incredibly poor data. Stuff that I can tell is wrong, and I'm not an engineer. All these people, so what I'm showing you here is this is the day of the spill. This is the data that my working group compiled. So this is, this is day of the spill and then how much oil is flowing out, the flow rate, right? 
So the first couple days, they're saying like 5,000 gallons. And you can ask me why they had these erroneous points. But the point is, totally wrong. Totally wrong. Uh, as, we go through, as we go through and people start figuring out something's wrong, we actually start, um, some reporters from NPR take some of the video of the oil burbling in the ocean and show it to some engineers. And they go, dude, I can look at this and tell you in like an hour what my estimate is. And it's orders of magnitude more than what these people are saying, what the government's saying. Right. And so, so we rapidly get into these, you know, more and more estimates. These are ranges of estimates. Um, and then this is what BP put on their permit. They said, if all things go to hell in a handbasket, we could have oil spilling off into the Gulf at that rate, right? Much, much higher than what actually was happening, right? Which that's what you want. You want worst case scenario. You want to estimate worse, the worst thing you can. Um, this is what the National Incident Command, which we'll talk about more, the, more about this in, in New Orleans, but the National Incident Command is the entity after 9-11 after that is in charge of dealing with disasters, a terrorist attack or whatever. So this is what the National Incident Command is saying um, is the worst case scenario. So they, weren't, they didn't even read the documents that were filed with the government. So wait, that's what it's allowed, or that's what they understood was what they thought it was going to be? That's what they thought, the, that's, what, that's what they identified in press releases and in press conference, what the worst case scenario would be as the oil is flowing out. The oil pipeline is pinched, so it's a little bit restricted. So it's not as if we pocket a giant hole in the ocean. It, it's kind of has to, even though it's squirting out, it's, it's got a limited uh, area through which it can squirt out. This is the final estimate of the flow rate technical group. This is the real estimate. This is, this is the best estimate we have. This is another independent estimate that these guys published in Science a couple months later, but it's, it's very similar to the flow rate technical group. This is a time lapse of what happened. So the red indicates significant coastal oiling. This is surface slicks. This is map surface slicks from satellites. So we're definitely getting oiling, but it's not that much oiling compared to, you know, for the amount of vo volume of oil that was coming out of the ground. Massive complexity. This is the largest human manifestation of a coordinated fleet since D-Day. This was insane. Over 5,000 vessels, uh, uh, regular oil-related vessels, uh, conscripted Shrimp boats, this was an insane, an amazingly complex uh, series of operations to try to eventually drill a relief well and intercept that well down deep under the surface of the ocean, just like what happened with Porter Ranch, who did the same thing, went down, drilled a relief well, sort of like a wasp, stung, stung into the well bore and then filled it up with cement and, and stopped the flow that way. Um, we really, really, really like things that we're familiar with and we're, we do a bad job of questioning things. So this is, uh, uh, you know, we really pay attention. Here's President Obama on the shore because idiots like me are saying, wetlands, wetlands. Oh my God, the oil's going to hurt the wetlands, right? So well, how do you show con concern? You go to the, you go to the shore, uh, you go up and you move eggs. This is well-intentioned this totally screwed us up. This is a simulation from the people that do the atmosphere, National Center for Atmospheric Research. They took some very simplified models, modeled the surface of the ocean and said, oh, this is what could happen. Oh, what happened? Here's the oil release. Okay, it's in Louisiana. Those people are all ignorant and stupid. Who cares about Louisiana, right? Florida, well, so, oh my God! Just came by Washington, D.C. <gasps> oh my God, New York, Washington, D.C.? Oh, we gotta do something. So all of a sudden, this is, this is, they, this is modeling the so-called loop current. Now people are, oh my God, wait, oil can come up here? Totally. Uh, and these were well-intentioned. This wasn't, these guys weren't trying to mess anybody up. This draws everyone's attention to the surface. They're modeling what's happening on the surface, the oil that's floating on the top of the ocean. That's not the important part, it turns out. But everybody is enamored of this story. 
Um, once the oil started flowing, we were screwed. We didn't have any good options. It was, it was, it was bad things, bad things, bad things. Um, we, could, we could try to capture the oil. We could try to turn it into something less toxic. That was most popularly uh, done with so-called dispersants, which take the oil that's a big lump of oil and turn it into little teeny tiny gloops of oil. Um, we had a lot of multidimensional trade-offs that people didn't talk about. This is what the oil looks like. This is weathered oil. It looks like rusty ribbons. It looks like this, which looks almost like sea ice, although it's orange. Um, a lot of it looked like this. This is a picture from a friend of mine. Uh, this is a flying fish. This is one of the few pictures of any animals in the oil. So the flying fish is skimming through this lightly oil sheened area of the ocean. Um, all kinds of bad things happen. I, I, we talked before about the um, inappropriate cleaning up of beaches and wetlands when they didn't need to do that. That's what's going on here. Here's these guys. Look at that. Oh, dig up the beach. That's really good. Yeah, great. That's going to help. Um, roadkill. For those of you that don't know me, I work on roadkill. And there's, there's roadkill. There's in the beach roadkill because all these, all these guys are driving back and forth on the beach. Kill the little bird. Um, all kinds of problems. Okay, get near the end here. All kinds of problems coming. Come, oh my God! Look at this. this. Is Obama's Katrina? Blah 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 blah. Dispersants become the hail mary. Dispersants are just like what we use in our sink, Dawn detergent, Dove, all that kind of jazz. Um, and the idea is, hey, let's throw this dispersant in there and take care of the problem, right? Make the oil be less toxic. This is what this is what dispersants do, right? So here's some oil. That's this straight up regular oil. Let's put the dispersants in. Boom, right? So it doesn't kill the oil, but it makes the oil be able to be surrounded by water molecules. And so therefore, for things that might break the oil down, like let's say microbes, it, makes, it gives them more surface area to attack the oil and hopefully break the oil down faster. That's the idea. This might get really loud. So this is what it looks like to apply dispersants. So we normally dis apply dispersants at the surface like this. This is a modified uh, firefighting airplane. It's going to drop dispersants instead of, instead of uh, uh, you know, fire suppressant. So they're ba literally dive bombing the ocean, dive bombing the oil. Um, uh, we don't, I want to keep this short, so I'm not going to go into toxicity. I'd love to talk for hours with you about this. But long story short, the, the stuff that we're dumping on the oil, the, toxic, the, the dispersants, they are toxic themselves. So we were making a calculated gamble. And knowing what we know, knew at the time, everybody's back was against the wall. We we're trying top hat. We we're trying all this kill shot. Nothing was working. It was, it was a, a great idea. It was, it was to, to be lauded. Um, but we didn't really understand the toxicity. And so we were throwing more toxic stuff into the ocean to hopefully make the oil be less toxic. That was the trade-off we thought we were making. And there's a whole bunch of stuff I can talk about this. This is, what, this is, this is the cooling. This is what we did. This is the raw feed that, that I copied off of the web because they wouldn't give me the raw HD footage. But what we're looking at is the bottom of the ocean. The, 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 this stuff here is oil. Okay. 1,500 meters down the bottom of the ocean. What we're seeing is we have an ROV. The ROV has a big uh, a squirter, tri triple squirter valve here. The white stuff is dispersant. So the brilliant idea was instead of applying dispersant at the surface where we've all historically done that, let's put it right into the oil stream and squirt it directly in. Awesome idea. Because it's going to mix it, right? It's going to mix it at the bottom. And great idea. And, and you guys may have watched this. People would watch this for hours and hours. This was very compelling video and people were thinking, how come we can't do anything to stop that? This is crazy. We got video of it. How come we can't cap that thing? Um, and so this is, yeah, you guys, you guys would care about this. Um, but, but basically, um, we put a lot of dispersant at the surface, but also a lot at the wellhead. We consumed one third of the global supply of dispersants on planet Earth. Let me say that again. We squirted in one third of all the dispersants that we had stockpiled into this one site. This was insane. This is a massive amount of dispersants released. Um, first, we start seeing this weird signal. And I'm going to go through this really quick because I know you guys are getting tired and want to go. Um, this is the first signal something was weird. This is, this is a uh, ROV. 
This is um, at about uh, 1,100 meters down deep in the ocean. This is what it looks like with the white light on. If you turn the white light off and turn the UV light on, there's a bunch of stuff in the water. Those aren't shrimp. It's something else. Turns out we now know that was oil. Oh, that was actually methane and oil mixed. Um, so we started to score this dispersant, and everybody's like, and people like me are saying, oh my God, oh my God, this is all Mars, this is all Mars, oh my God. And then they started squirting this stuff, and they're like, dude, we are so badass because the marshes are cool, right? This guy's smart. Completely ignored all this stuff. So when we found this paper, which was paid for by the Minerals Management Service, which was the then federal agency that's been broken up, and the federal agency that dealt with this stuff, this was funded research project. This is a model of exactly what happened with Deepwater Horizon. And the short version is this. We also had some politicians, some of which you may meet on our trip, that said things like, we're not stupid. We know what happens when you mix oil and water. We need to do something. Well, they were stupid because this is what they said. This is what we all thought would happen. Here's some oil released. Ah, oil goes to the surface and accumulates to the surface, right? We're not stupid. This is what actually happened. The oil coming out of the bottom of the ocean at that pressure is negatively buoyant. Let me say that again. The oil at that depth and pressure is not, does not float on the surface of the ocean. The only reason any oil came up from the bottom is because it was being blasted out by a giant fire hose of all this pressure. What pulled the oil up was methane. This was primarily a methane spill, just like Porter Ranch. There was also some oil in there but it was primarily a methane thing and that methane gas brought up the oil. So what, in this case, what you're seeing is that it's becoming, you know, the, the, the pressure of pulling it up is neutralized and this has become neutrally buoyant right here below the surface of the ocean. No dispersants, no dispersants. The oil was heavily dispersed when it came out of the bottom of the ocean because it came out of a straw and there's so much turbulent mixing, it was broken up into little t tiny oil droplets on its own and it's mixed with all this gas. So the dispersant clearly did something. It clearly helped. But, and this is a contentious point between some of my colleagues and I, we don't know because BP didn't allow us to collect the data we should have collected. And the federal government didn't insist on collecting this data. And so long story short, just like with Refugio, the incident command totally screwed the pooch. And so we don't know how effective that dispersant will be. And I've been in some, I've had some disagreements with uh, some of the industry folks about that, but I'm right, <laughs> is the answer. Um, so, so, okay, so look, okay, so oil did wash ashore, not a huge amount. Um, we started seeing some oil birds, but not a huge amount. So people said, where all the oil go? We created this so-called oil spill calculator, which is a tool used for people trying to pick up oil. Um, and long story short is, look, residual, uh, most of it, like, we can't account for it. Hey, so great. This is what happened, right? Look at all these diagrams. These diagrams are all wrong. Uh, yeah, we have all this other evidence. Okay, so this is what happened. We took an incorrect understanding of oil spills. We took our previous experience with every single oil spill in history. Th that's this. A little bit of oil sometimes comes out next to the oil, oil, oil wellhead. Most of it floats up. The, the stuff that can volatize goes up in the air. The other stuff goes in, a surface kills the poor birds on the surface, and, and oils the beaches and wetlands. That's, what, that's why I was complaining and worried. All we did, all I did incorrectly, was do this. Take that same model, move it deep, and say, ah, oh, this is what's going on. This is what we now know, we now recognize to be the real story as to what happened with this oil spill. This was the first time a deep water well was, had ever happened, had ever spilled like this, first time in history. So this is what happened. We applied dispersants not only at the surface, but as you guys saw down deep, but this was the key thing. This massive, massive plume of dispersed oil and methane at 1,200 to 1,400 meters that just hung out there. 
We started noticing something was wrong by looking at sediment depositions. This is one of my colleague, Mandy Joy, from University of Georgia. This is far away. This is a core from the bottom of the ocean. It, it's, it's a core of crap. Well, I shouldn't say that. That's not nice. It's a core of sediment, right? Macroscopic things live in there. Worms, little, little snails with shells. Mandy has never found a core that didn't at least have something, a worm, a snail, something macroscopic. Oh, there's always bacteria in there, but something macroscopic until this happened. So this is getting a little bit close towards the oil spill. Um, this is far away. This is getting a little close. And there's this oily sheen. When you started getting really close to the oil spill, you started seeing this. It's inches of this oily black snot on the surface of the ocean sediments. And nothing macroscopic is alive in there. We started seeing things like this. This is, this is a Gorgonian, a little uh, kind of uh, 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 colonial animal. And this is a commensal um, uh, sea urchin, star, uh, sea star, sorry, sea star in there. This is what we started seeing next to the oil spill. So this, you know, what's up? That dude's all tweaked out. Is he dead? Probably. What's going on with this guy? This guy looks dead, right? Totally weird. Started seeing crabs with weird things, and, and this goes on and on. So we definitely had oil spill impacts in the marshes, but it's, you know, a few feet. This is boom that was supposed to protect this. It washed up. So definitely screwed up the marsh, but a little bit of the marsh, right? This isn't going miles and miles inland or anything like this. And this actually, if these guys, these contractors hadn't illegally torn up this place, this would have re-sprouted. At least a good chunk of it would have re-sprouted with, with new shoots the following year. And that's what we saw happen. We saw things like this, a massive fish kill. This is not a road. This is, who knows, tens of thousands of dead fish. Never, we, yeah, long story short, we've never seen anything like this before. Uh, alligators. We started seeing alligators having different parasite loads in areas near the oil spill versus far away. Grad student working on this. Well, yeah, it's, I'll tell you that when I'm not recording. <laughs> um, so we see things like uh, turtles get oiled, um, all kinds of issues, all kinds of issues. Then we close down fishing in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Why? Because we have this oil. Huge area. This is, the, this is one estimate of the economic impacts of this. Huge problem. Um, yeah, you don't care about that. This is a spider diagram, and we'll, we'll end uh, in a second here. This is a spider diagram of what we think the old oil spills were. Let me, let me orient you. This is the water column. This is shallow to deep. This is the bottom of the ocean. This is shallow seagrass to down deep in the bottom of the ocean, the, the sediment. This is areas along the sides, sandy beach, mud flat, marsh, oyster reef. So this is a conceptual model we created to communicate what happened with the oil spill. So this is where, with a traditional oil spill, this is where the oil spill would be. If you guys don't know how to read these diagrams, there's only one axis. You start at the center, that's zero. As you go any direction out, it's larger value. Cool? So the biggest impacts in a traditional spill are going to be felt in the salt marsh, uh, in the shallow surface water. It makes sense? Down here is not much impact. This is what we think happened with the deep water horizon. There's a little bit of impacting some mud flats and all that good stuff, but mostly it's happening down deep in the mid water in the deep benthos. Same exact figure. I've shrunk this. So have a look at this. This is what we did. The National Science Foundation needs to be given congratulations because they were the only, they're the first entity that gives scientists money to actually go out and start monitoring this with a program called the rapid program. And so we went, went through and we looked at all the projects they funded. And what do they fund? Idiots like me. Why do you get funded by this? But you know what I'm saying? So look where we spent. This is where we spent our money. Again, this is to monitor right before the oil comes and nukes the place. So we know what, how, what the condition of the site was beforehand. Look, everybody went to the salt marsh because idiots like me were screaming, salt marsh, salt marsh, salt marsh. So everybody, let's go count the salt marsh. But the reality was, clearly the salt marsh was impacted, but, but a fraction of the total impact, right? So they spent a little bit in slightly deeper in the water column, almost nothing down deep. The natural resources damage assessment effort, which is done by NOAA, and we can talk about that later in, in New Orleans, but, but suffice it to say, these guys did a little bit better. They didn't quite spend as much money. But where did we spend the money? 
We didn't spend the money in the right place. This is, has been, is being contested in the courts. So if we don't know what the condition was before the oil spill happened, how do we prove that in court? So when I say that we killed millions and millions and millions of jellyfish, what do the lawyers say for the oil companies? They say, oh, thank you, Dr. Anderson, that's great. So, um, yeah, why do you say that? Why do you say we killed millions of, like, oh, you know, they show models and blah, 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 water column, blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay, cool. Hey, so can you show me how many jellyfish were there the year before? Oh, well, I wasn't, I wasn't counting the jellyfish before. Oh, you weren't counting the jellyfish before? Isn't that interesting? So you can't actually prove that to me, that we killed that many jellyfish, right? Well, I know, but oh, so you can't? Okay, great, thanks. The poorest studied marine and coastal areas in all of the U.S., Hawaii, Alaska, whatever, is the Gulf of Mexico. There's the, it's the only site without a so-called LTER, National Science Foundation Long-Term Ecological Research Monitor. No, despite what they'll, some people will tell you, we didn't know crap. We don't know crap about the long-term dynamics of the sediment, of the water column, all this kind of stuff. Right? Why? Don't want to fund that stuff. Don't want to fund that stuff, right? Because then you might know what's going on. Uh, when I went to a conference, so then BP, to their credit, gives a half billion dollars for these scientists to just study what happened with Deepwater Horizon. And I, I am affiliated with that. I, I help review papers and stuff. Um, but we, have, we also have annual, an annual conference. This is the first conference. Um, this, is, this is where, when you go through and look at all the researchers' uh, papers, this is, this is what we found. Look at, a, a bunch of people are talking about the marsh impacts. We're still not getting down to the deep, the deep what's going on. So if we're not studying where the actual oil spill impacts were, we're not going to be able to tell you what the impacts were. So we'll finish up with this. This is the last slide. We need to conceptualize these problems better. You, we need to understand how hurricanes are impacting our world better. We need to understand um, these systems. Otherwise, we are in a deep pile of doo-doo. When idiots like me talk about jellyfish, most people don't care about jellyfish. They, they're weird, right? They sting you. Or the mud, the critters in the bottom of the ocean. Are you kidding me? Mud? That's gross. We need to think holistically, not just about the problem, but about our responses to the problem. So I would suggest one way to do this is with guys like this. This is from a, a wellhead, uh, not, not, not as deep as the Deepwater Horizon, but you know, about 1,000 meters or so down. This is an ROV doing an inspection. They're checking out the wellhead, checking it out, and the guy's like, did you see that? And the guy says, what? You see that? I pull back. So he pulls back, and what is it? It's a sperm whale coming down to check out what's going on. Now, sperm whales, people care about whales, right? They're warm fuzzy, they have big eyes, right? They're cute, right? Um, check it out, a sperm whale, what's a sperm whale do? A sperm whale needs to breathe air. Sperm whale needs to be at the surface of the ocean. So if we have an oil slick, sperm whale is gonna be hurt by that, one. Two, sperm whales feed down deep, down here. Check them out, he's like, I'm getting out of here, right? Feed on squid, feed on fish down there. So if we nuked the squid population, the sperm whales should show that, right? And that is something people might care about. We can talk about that. And uh, long story short, their movement and patterns changed after the Deepwater Horizon. So we'll talk more about the Deepwater Horizon and the impacts. This is just a brief introduction, but a huge impacts to our human society as well as our natural ecosystems. Okay, great.